Welcome to Healthcare Triage Live. I'm trying not to check the news constantly while I talk to you because the, the, uh, the yeses and noes and the votes is driving me. Ugh, oh, these are trying times. These are trying times. Welcome to Healthcare Triage. It's been a long time since we've been able to do this. Tons of travel. I was gone for various reasons. Stan was traveling. I'm sure Mark was gone at some point. Who knows? Um, any support you can always give at patreon.com so healthcare triage is appreciated. We appreciate everybody who gives us any support. It's what helps us keep the lights on, literally, um, and keep all this going. Check it out there. But we did a whole month this month on orphan drugs. I was super proud of it. And then I found out that anytime you use the word drugs, YouTube sort of squashes it in some ways. So that might have actually affected traffic, which is just depressing because it was a phenomenal series with a lot of work from Nick Bagley, friend of the blog, friend of the show. Anyway, let's get started. There's so much going on right now. We could do this entire show just on what the hell's going on in Congress and the AHCA right now and what's actually gonna happen. Um, we could even do it like live streaming it because they're changing their, their minds right in front of our eyes, but let's not. We'll go with your questions instead. So let's start with N Kicker. As a doctor and health services researcher, how do I feel about the show 13 Reasons Why? Does it stimulate needed conversation on teen suicide and harassment or does it send the wrong message? Can it be both? All right, if you don't know, 13 Reasons Why is a popular show that is now a Netflix series that, uh, that was based on a reasonably popular book, um, which is basically about a girl who commits suicide and she tells the 13 reasons or 13 reasons why that led up to that. Um, and the episodes, I believe, are probably arranged around the 13 reasons for 13. No, I didn't watch it. Full, full disclosure. I'm familiar with the book, I'm familiar with the show, I'm familiar with the controversy. The pros of it, and certainly the show made a decent effort, you know, from what I gather, to talk to experts, is it does bring up conversations and let you on harassment and teen suicide um, and, and make it so that it's, perhaps it is something that, that we will talk about with our adolescents more. Fine. I, I also make no comments on the production values or the quality of the acting or anything else. I'm, I don't know anything about it. The negatives are two. One is that, and this is the big one, is that from what I gather, it shows the suicide in episode 13. Literally shows it. Um, in the book, it was, from what I gather again, pills, falling asleep, not waking up. In the show, they translated it to uh, cutting your wrists and then bleeding out in a bathtub. That's more dramatic, certainly looks better on TV, I'm sure, if you're concerned about the drama, but it's horrifying. Um, also, actually showing the suicide um, is problematic because there's good evidence that these things cluster, that you know, when there's a lot of news and press about a suicide, more suicides occur. Um, this has been shown in many studies, and therefore many people are concerned, rightfully so, that actually showing the suicide might make it more likely that some kids will actually go through with a suicide. That's a problem. We could have avoided that. The second thing is, and this is more me personally, it gives the impression that, that suicide is not part of like um, depression, which is a mental illness. It gives the aspect that it's like, oh, it's something that happens to you because of external effects. Um, if people would just be nicer to you, you wouldn't be depressed. If people didn't do mean things to you or harass you, you wouldn't be depressed. I absolutely give you that it can be a component um, about you know, why suicide occurs and why depression exists and that bullying is terrible, but I'm willing to bet the money in my pocket, and I could be wrong, that one of the 13 reasons why isn't you were clinically depressed or you had a mental health issue. Um, it makes it appear that suicide is something that happens to people who would otherwise be perfectly happy, but some people are mean, and, and, and maybe some, but that's, it, it, it's, it, it's not, it, it sort of removes the mental health aspects of it, and I'm not quite comfortable with that. Um, it makes it out to be that like, um, depression and or suicide are externally caused only, and that's not true. Um, people with everything seemingly going for them as well can you know, suffer from depression and anxiety, and that's complex, and probably hard to do in a show. There you go. Lisa Jones says, what age is old enough to drink some caffeine? My two year old's been drinking my decaf iced coffee black for about a year now. I recently switched to caffeinated and he still wants it. Oh, that is so hard to answer. Um, you know, we give, we give small babies in the NICU caffeine, it spurs them on to breathe. So it's not as if there's a harm from caffeine in and of itself. The problem is that it's like kids don't need that. They don't need something which makes them active. Maybe it helps perhaps with impulse control. Um, 
you know, you don't want to get their heart racing more than it needs to be. You know, this is one of those where there's probably just not much evidence. Would I avoid it most of the time? Sure. Would a sip of like your coffee going to do damage? Really, probably not. Um, there is no evidence probably saying like, you know, that what you're doing would hurt your child, but I got to be honest. Um, we don't let, we didn't let our small children drink a lot of caffeine. And even now I pretty much try to limit their caffeine and they're getting to be teenagers. Um, but again, if they were going to have a cup of coffee, I wouldn't stop them either. Noah drinks tea and he loves it. I'm not going to stop him. If Jacob has a soda once now that has caffeine or even Sydney and she's, you know, 11, so be it. But a two year old, eh, especially if it's causing problems with behavior, but you know, there's not a lot of evidence and probably people shouldn't be judging you too harshly. Thoughts on Trump's rollback of nutrition legislation, school lunches, calorie counts on menus. See, this is the problem is that we're lumping everything together. Um, school lunches need to be nutrition. all. Oh, it's a good, better word. Um, and I think a number of the steps that we've been taking recently by trying to focus on sort of nutrients and not necessarily, like there were some good moves being taken. Um, Backing off is not so good. Making it so that Lunchables is the only thing that qualifies for school lunches probably isn't the best thing. On the other hand, you know how I feel about menu labeling. I actually don't think that does a ton of good, and I'm not necessarily in favor of backing off on that if we take the same money and we keep putting it into other stuff which might make a difference. We did a whole episode on menu labeling. You should go watch it. Um, and so I'm not, you know, I'm not as irked about that as I am in you know, interfering and sort of trying to do other things which might be good for children's nutrition. And I'm certainly never okay with not paying for kids, you know, trying to reduce the school lunch program. Paying for kids' lunches who are hungry is massively important, and breakfast for that matter, or any food for all I care. One decade later asks, how deterministic are you when making diagnoses or treatment recommendations? Is there a point when instinct or emotion play a role or is it numbers all the way down? So this is the thing my attitude and my talking about things depends on my sort of assuredness about what I'm talking about. There are some, like, if I do a strep test and it says it's positive and it looks like strep throat, I'm sure that's strep throat. The likelihood is almost, you know, massively high. If it's soft, then I offer more options. It also depends on the individual case. For instance, um, I see patients who are sicker than most. My patient population in clinic is very ill. Um, with multiple chronic conditions. Uh, and I saw a patient recently where, um, you know, the child had many, many chronic conditions um, and was now coming in with, you know, what sounded like an upper respiratory infection, but I don't know, you know, pot potentially could be pneumonia, but had so much lung disease and was so critically ill and, you know, on a vent that, or on a trach, I should say, on a breathing helper, that, you know, I would, in a, in a, in a child who is, Otherwise healthy, I would have been like, this is a virus, go home. But with this patient, I told the mom, you, you want antibiotics? It's, a, you know, whatever you sort of want. Because this has happened multiple, multiple times before where this child, you know, it, it could, could, you know, the URI leads to an infection which leads to hospitalization and an intensive care unit stay. I'm not sure. I'm sure over here that this is, you know, I know what to do over here. But over here, I'm not sure. And when that's not the case, mom and I have a discussion. Do you want the antibiotic? Do you want a prescription for an antibiotic? Do you want to take it home? Do you want to use it if you need it? Because this is, this is a different situation. So my determinism, my recommendations, my sort of patient to get differed on the situation, how sure I am and what's going on. It is not numbers all the way down. The motion certainly does play a role and I'd be stupid to think that I'm somehow immune to that. Um, instinct absolutely plays a role, but also just, you know, a willingness to know that the evidence applies here does not apply here and you need to know when. Quinsoft. A Reddit user says the Win 10 creators update is adding night light, a feature that shifts the screen color balance of the red end in order to lessen the impact of blue light on the user's sleep cycle. This brings up the question, how much research is out there on blue light exposure and sleep and does it support the reduction of blue light at night as a way to meaningfully improve sleep? I'm not as well versed in this research as I should, but it seems like there's some, back, some to support that. Having said that, this is a low cost thing. You don't like it, don't do it. If you're having no sleep problems at all and you're using blue light, fine. But if you're having sleep problems, this is an almost no cost thing you could try to see if it works. They're providing a feature. Use it, don't use it. No one is making you use it. And I bet you can turn it off if you don't like it. So I don't really get too excited about it. If we started charging for it or demanding its use, then I might wade in. But these kinds of things which are low cost, not mandatory, you can try it if you want it, fine. But you know what, you've spurred me. I should go look into that. 
What will the world of healthcare and insurance look like in a few months? Should I start crying now? Uh, you aren't crying already? You aren't paying attention. I don't know. I swear to God, I wish I knew. Um, it's so hard to make predictions at this point. I feel like I haven't checked Twitter in 10 minutes and I have no idea where the whip count stands. I, here's my thoughts. I think that there's a, there's a good chance this bill still doesn't get a vote in the House. Even if it does pass the House, there's an incredibly solid chance that it can't even get to the Senate because of reconciliation rules, or that if it does, it can't pass, or if it does, it'll be so radically stripped and changed at that point that even if it went back to the House, I'm not sure it could get House approval again. Um, because a lot of the stuff, all the changes they're making for the most part to drive this bill to completion are moving it to the right to please the Freedom Caucus. Those are the things which will make it even harder to pass in the Senate we, we've done episodes that everything is trade-offs. The problem is that these are irreconcilable differences. These people want one thing, these people want another thing, and as we keep moving in one direction, it goes like that. So I don't, I don't see how this gets to completion. If it does, I don't see how it does it in any way that is not massively unpopular and has a backlash. Having said that, what do I know? All predictions are off. No one knows what's going on. I am crying about it, though. Lisa Jones thought, oh, I already, oh we already did that question. Sorry, I'm, did I skip ahead? I apologize. Oh, I think they're the same question twice. Anyway, Heather Allen, should doctors be allowed to go on strike? I, I, yeah. Well, sort of yes and no. I mean, it's like there's, you know, if all doctors went on strike, patients could die. I mean, you know, that's not okay. Um, we don't work, I don't know, this is a legal thing. And you're asking me, if you're asking me from a legal aspect, go ask a lawyer, I don't know. If you're asking me from a more like just thoughtful moral aspect, I think doctors should be able to demand certain things, um, but they also have an obligation for treatment and certain you know, obligations to take care of everyone no matter what. So I'm sure there's some kind of step down work that they could do, but if it led to bad outcomes or patient deaths, I mean, I don't, how could they, I don't know. So um, that would be really, really difficult. I don't have a good answer for you, I just don't. Vasily Mankiewicz, disc herniation reversible, what therapy would you recommend? Oh my God, I don't know. Back pain and disc problems, so hard to answer, so good, few good studies and options. Um, some things probably have some evidence for surgery, but it's really particular, um, and you would have to get really into the weeds. You should talk to your doctor, because this is not the right place to get that. On the other hand, I just wrote a column for the New York Times on treatment of low back pain, not disc herniation, um, that we made into an episode. You'll see that in the future. Trey Harris asks, the AHCA, what does it do about employer-based coverage? Will out-of-pocket limits and lifetime maximums be eliminated? Other changes. There's no legislative text at this moment. Literally none. Can't judge it. I can't see a CBO report because they ain't going to get one before they vote on it. So what will it do? No one knows. The last version of it actually would reduce employer-based coverage by a certain amount. I would imagine the new one might too, but we don't know. Now it doesn't literally go in and change many things, but because this is an incredibly complex market with huge trade-offs, even changes to other aspects of the bill make changes to employer-based coverage. So the AHCA, when it was judged by the CBO the last time they considered it but didn't vote on it, reduced employer-based coverage by a couple million people. I imagine this one will do the same, but there's no text. There's literally, there's literally nothing to read that I could look at to tell, okay, I gotta calm down, to tell you what this is uh, going to say. And then there's certainly no, um, there's certainly no CBO score. Will it change out-of-pocket limits and lifetime maximums? I, it's going to change out-of-pocket costs. There's no question it won't because it changes the, the actuarial values of many policies. And especially if like some of these things go in place where they can change many of the regulations and states can get waivers. Yeah, all of this stuff could change. No one knows because we still don't even have a legislative text. Meredith Smith, what would you recommend for someone who's looking for birth control options that don't contribute to estrogen and water? Is estrogen and water a real problem or just fake new, I'm gonna guess news you mean. Um, why is there going to be estrogen and water? Pee. You always that pee? I mean, but you, there's estrogen in the body. I mean, people have estrogen all the time. This is not something I've actually heard of. All right, look, go with an IUD. If you're, I mean, you can go with IUDs that have low hormone and still work phenomenally well. Um, IUDs are, we've done whole episodes on IUDs. Again, you should talk to your doctor about your own medical advice and everything else, but um, again, 
uh, IUDs work really well. I don't know that estrogen in the water is a real problem. I mean, the dosage, if it got spread out in the water supply, would have to be so low that I can't fathom how this could be a real thing. But I will look into it. Gwendolyn H. is a pediatrician and a parent. How do you feel about co-sleeping? God, is that tricky. Um, this is one where it's like the studies that we have and they are not randomized controlled trials show that sleeping in the bed can be dangerous, can increase you know, the risk of suffocation and everything else, especially if people are overtired, if they are drinking, if they are doing drugs. Having said that, the alternative evidence is that it might improve breastfeeding um, and therefore, and there's lots of cultures that do this. The, if, you are, if you are an absolutist and you say, I just want to reduce the risk of child, children dying or being suffocated, yes, no co-sleeping. It will reduce the infant mortality by some amount. Um, it probably has other benefits on the other side that can be weighed. My wife and I did it at times because we were too damn tired. And Jacob, especially Jacob, our first child, would not sleep. And there were times when we just couldn't take it anymore. And so we'd go get him and Amy would feed him and he would sleep between the two of us. Yeah, did we, in, we, did we marginally increase the risk of some things? Yes. Did we potentially decrease the risk of other things? Maybe. Does everything turn out the vast, vast, vast majority of the time? Yes. Would I still recommend that to other people? Probably not. But I'm human, and so that is what happened with us. And I try to be honest when I talk about these things. Um, but the evidence and the data that are out there and the American Academy of Pediatric Recommendations and everything else would say do not do it. Um, it increases the risk of uh, potentially suffocation and other problems. And probably the evidence says that, but you can find plenty of, plenty of people to disagree. Um, I have found in my personal experience, everybody officially says don't do it. Tons of people still do. It is just, it is that kind of thing. But the recommendations, if you look at them officially, would say do not do it. Meredith Smith asks, my friend just found out she's pregnant, believes it's fine to smoke because her child is still the size of a poppy seed. Do you know of any literature she should look into regarding this? I'm very concerned for her child because she's limited to smoking a cig three cigarettes day during an entire pregnancy. Smoking is bad. Smoking is bad. Smoking is bad for her. Smoking is bad for her child. Um, it's just bad. Um, now, is there evidence where they do randomized controlled trials and they look at which day you're smoking? No. No. There never will be. We will never have those randomized controlled trials. There's studies that show smoking more is worse than smoking less, you know, and that smoking is bad because of development and smoking is bad for baby. And the whole thing about the size of the pea, it's, I don't buy that or the, well, poppy seed. Poppy seed, really? I mean, it's like you got to be pretty early in pregnancy for poppy seed. And if she knows she's pregnant, she's probably much further along than poppy seed. I mean, by the time you get to 12 weeks and people are talking about it, you can do, old, you can do sonograms and you can find a heartbeat and stuff like that. It's not a poppy seed. Um, so I would stop smoking. Smoking's just so bad for you. I would just stop, period. But, um, but the, you know, she could find plenty of literature that will say that smoking is bad. Smoking is bad for, for women who are pregnant um, and that they should not do it. Um, and I wouldn't get into the, the weeds of like how many cigarettes per day and on what day of pregnancy because you're not going to probably ever get that granular. Trey Harris, aren't there some rare non-terminal diseases like certain spondyloarthropathies where long-term opioids have been shown more effective? Are you worried reform will make life hard for such patients? Everything is trade-offs, man. I have friends, doctors, we talk about this on gaming night, where they, they are complaining because they treat very, very sick, painful pee things, and they know that now everything has gotten much harder to use opioids appropriately. Yes. Yes. When you say, does it help? There are studies you can find with the pain medicines work. The problem is that we've gone with the pendulum has swung in the wrong direction. And at this point, we're trying to swing it back. And just as there were side, you know, downstream trade-offs and trying to make it easier to prescribe pain meds and to recognize pain as a real problem that made it better for some people and terrible for a lot, the pendulum will swing back. Do, will we ever create policy which is 100% good and has no downsides? No. And trying to get there is a waste of time. So yes, there are probably appropriate uses of opioids. Yes, it will be harder to jump through the hoops. You still can get them, however, it'll work. Um, and will this be more painful and difficult for people who are trying to do the right thing? Yes, yes. Is that what may need to happen in order to try to get the benefit that we're trying to get of reducing massive overprescription of opioids and all the problems that are happening? Yes, I live in the real world. Spencer Nuttinger, ginger ale was often given to me as to treat an upset stomach as a kid. Does this have any research behind it? Again, this is like one of those, is there an RCT? I doubt it, but who cares? 
It's low cost. It has no downstream side effects, really, other than, you know, I guess the weight gained by over drinking ginger ale, but that, come on, we're not doing that. Um, it's over the counter. You don't ask anyone else to pay for it. So why not? If it works, who cares? Even if it does, who cares? If, you know, I heard the same thing. Sometimes I heard Coke syrup or Coke, whatever. If it settles your stomach, it has almost no downside. You could try it. If it doesn't work, then well, I've learned a lesson. You could try it. I don't know of any RCTs that have looked at this. I doubt there ever will be one. Um, but I, I wrote actually a piece literally today on my blog about this because people are like, well, you know, you have all these like double standards when it comes to medicines or not. It's like, I don't. Everything is benefits and harms. If the harms, including costs, are so infinitesimal, then I don't need as proven benefits as much. My problem is as harms goes up, well, then you better prove the benefits. So I, the example is I drink tea for a sore throat. I have no concept and no belief that the tea is curing the underlying disease of my sore throat. It's symptomatic care. It makes me feel better. It has no cost. It has, I'm sure you could find a story of someone who burned their throat or even died from tea, but for the most part it has no downside, but it has no harms. I'm not asking you to pay for it. It's entirely out of pocket. I think it works. Why not? What's the, sure, sure, it's symptomatic treatment. Same thing with ginger ale. Go, if it works for you, great. If it doesn't, then don't use it anymore. I, that's the end of it. Don't, don't, don't feel this need. It has no harms at all. Rick Karras, super bugs versus antibiotics, declining effectiveness, real or overblown, or is drug pricing hindering response? We've done whole episodes on antibiotics and all this stuff, so I'm actually gonna refer you right there. We've covered this exact thing in episodes, talking about the problem of antibiotics and how they decline over time and what's going on in the pipeline and everything else, and way more than I can answer in the 20 or 30 seconds here. Go watch that episode. The Churchill 19. Why is spermicide not talked about as much as birth control, auxiliary, or otherwise? Is there some data that I'm not aware of that indicates spermicides perform worse than other methods? Yes, yeah, they don't, they don't work as well. They don't work as well as, well I mean, they're often on condoms, first of all, so let's own that. So spermicide and condom, better than condom alone. But compared to the pill, compared to, you know, IUDs, compared to implants, no, they're not, they're not even on the same level. Because they, they just don't, are they better than the pull-out method? Yeah. But, you know, I'm not going to push that over a condom, or with a condom, it'd be great again, but I'm not one or the other. And if I had to choose between that or an IUD or hormonal birth control, that works better, which is the reason why. So it's not that we're, you know, I think not talking about it, it just doesn't work as well. Now, if you use it in conjunction with other things, it's absolutely great, and it increases the effectiveness of the condoms, or if you use a spermicide plus something else, great, fine, fine. But if it's alone, no, it doesn't have the same level of effectiveness, and I think that's why it, it, it doesn't get talked about as much. And also, it has to be used correctly and thoroughly, and that's not always easy to do. AJ Jack, what do you tell parents considering non-effective based treatments for their children if there's no obvious harm? Do you worry about the relationship with the family if you advise against it? I gave the same spiel without half the, with less snark than I just gave a few minutes ago. Um, I say, you know, there's no benefit of that. You know, so I, I weigh benefits and harms, and if there's really no harm, then you can try it, but I wouldn't be, you know, any effect you might get might be placebo, but who cares? If people come in and they tell me they put a little honey in the tea and it makes them feel better, and the kid is over one year old and you're not worried about botulism, fine! What do I care? Now, if they tell me they're not going to use chemotherapy for their cancer and they're instead gonna use magic herbs, then I'm gonna get involved, because now we have proven benefit, huge disease problem, and that, now that's a big difference. But if it's a minor thing or a small thing, fine, then it doesn't matter. You know, especially if we're treating something for which we don't really have much evidence or what to do anyway, like a cold, then, you know, if they're doing symptomatic care, if they're rubbing their belly, I, a hug, who cares? Silent rebuke, what are the risk benefits of urban, oh, sorry, HEB, HEP A and HEP A B vaccines for infants. Is it really necessary immediately after birth if mom is, ne well, okay. Is it immediately necessary after birth, right after birth? No, but why, why are we waiting? That's the thing, it's like we have the kids, we're, we're giving them the vaccines, that's why we do it. It's a bloodborne thing, so sex is a real concern, but so are transfusions and other ways they do it. Once in a while you could be worried about maternal child transmission, but that's the vast majority we're not. It's because we have them, and that's why we do it. Um, and waiting makes it less effective, and there's no harm. So that, again, it's like it's a benefit and risk thing. With no harm and a benefit, I lean towards doing it. 
Last question. As Liouf. I found so much compelling evidence for a plant-based whole foods diet, also known as a vegan diet with no junk, going back decades. Do you find it convincing, promising, overhyped? All right. When you say compelling evidence, what do you mean? So, my God, I've got a whole book coming out in November, The Bad Food Bible, and we will talk about it many, many times as we get closer to publication. But, you know, here's the deal. There's so little good evidence promoting any one diet above another. Um, you know, it's like, what's his name? Uh, Michio Kuk, what's his name? Uh, no, it's not him. I'm thinking of the wrong guy. The guy with the, the macrobiotic diet. It's not, it's not him. It was another guy. The guy who invented the macrobiotic diet, who basically was pushing for like vegan and, and all plants and everything, got one kind of cancer when he was finally cured died of pancreatic cancer. It's an anecdote. It's ridiculous. It's a story I talk about in the book. But here's the thing. There is no guarantee. There is no great randomized controlled trial which shows massive benefits and everything else. These are all anecdotal or case series or animal based or, you know, short term. And I just turned Siri on just by talking, which is frightening. Um, so I, I, look, if you want to eat a vegan diet with no junk, great. I'm, I endorse it, I'm fine with it. If you want to eat a vegan diet with a little bit of junk, fine, I'm, I'm fine. If you want to eat a well-balanced well -balanced diet that includes animal products, that's great, I'm fine, I endorse it. I, it's all fine. We have our rule, I have my rules for eating. We've done episodes on that. We have a nice poster. You can even get it at the Facebook. I, it's all great. Um, but there is no massive compelling evidence that you're saying to say that a plant-based whole food diet is superior in long-term outcomes in the way that matters. If there was, I would say so on here. Um, and if you find that evidence, you feel free to send it to me. I'm going to make a plug for that mug. Yeah. Is that what I'm doing? Mark asked me to make a plug for the mug. Why today on the mug? I don't know. You can get this mug. You can get lots of good healthcare triage stuff, including, oh, I don't have it today. The little thing that holds your badge, the lunchbox, which is awesome, posters. I have a poster up in my office. You should have one um, at httmerch.com. All that kind of stuff helps support the show as well. Um, if you want, go to patreon.com slash healthcare triage. You can support the show that way as well. Check us out. All our shows, Friday news, Wednesdays live, Wednesdays live when we can. I think we're going to do it next Wednesday. We should be able to. I think I will be here, even though I'm going to San Francisco this weekend. If you're one of the people going to PAS this weekend, try and find me. I'll be there. It's in San Francisco. Anyway, thanks for watching. We really appreciate it. We'll see you next week.